Welcome to Consulting Unplugged. I am Andrew Peck, your host. I am a dyed-in-the-wool entrepreneur and advisor to many top executives, companies, and innovators throughout the world. I'm looking forward to spending this time with you as we learn some pretty amazing lessons from emerging and seasoned entrepreneurs, innovators, best-selling authors, and change makers. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me on my show, Consulting Unplugged. When you're done watching or listening, I hope you take a minute and write a quick review on whichever podcast platform you heard this show. Your insights will help others to be inspired and more proactive about their business or career. Be sure to follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook under the name Andrew Peck, and Peck is spelled P-E-K. And please don't hesitate to subscribe to my Consulting Unplugged mailing and member group by visiting my platform, consultingunplugged.com, where you will be the first to know about my upcoming podcasts, educational programs, mentoring, tips, and tools for helping you become the best entrepreneur, innovator, and change maker that you can be. One of my favorite movies back in the day was uh, Jurassic Park, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. Uh, obviously, it was full of a lot of action and suspense. Um, but uh, one of the characters I especially liked was um, Ian Malcolm, Dr. Ian Malcolm, the gifted mathematician who specializes in chaos theory. Uh, I believe the character, Ian Malcolm's character, was inspired by, in part, by the American historian of science, James Gleick, and French mathematician Ivar Eklund. Well, my next guest on Consulting Unplugged is... Uh, as close as you can get to that character, um, um, but even more engaging, uh, brilliant mathematician and social scientist. His name is Scott Page. Let me tell you about Scott. Uh, he is the John Seeley Brown Distinguished University Professor of Complexity, Social Science and Management at the University of Michigan. He is also the Williamson Family Professor of Business Administration, Professor of Management and Organizations, uh, Stephen M. Ross School of Business, Professor of Political Science, Professor of Complex Systems, and Professor of Economics, LSA. He's also an external faculty member of the Santa Fe Institute. Trust me, he is smart, he is credentialed, and you're going to love him. Uh, Scott's research focus is on the function of diversity in complex social systems, the potential for collective intelligence, and the design of institutions for meeting the challenges of a complex world. Recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and Fellowship at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, Scott was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts in Sciences in 2011. His fifth book, which I know you're gonna to wanna to get is The Model Thinker, was published by Basic Books in November, 2018. Uh, he's been a featured speaker at the World Economic Forum, Forum Davos, the New York Times World uh, New Work Summit, Google Rework, uh, and the Aspen Ideas Festival, Festival, and has consulted with the Federal Reserve System, the White House Office of Personnel, Yahoo, Ford, DARPA, Procter & Gamble, BlackRock, and AB in InBev, to name a few. Uh, we covered so much ground uh, from complexity theory to diversity to inclusion, executive behavior, and the importance of uh, diverse uh, and uh, process-oriented teams coming together to achieve breakthrough innovations, something that you won't want to miss. It is my absolute uh, uh, pleasure to welcome Scott Page on Consulting Unplugged. Well, Scott, I am so delighted to have you on my podcast, Consulting Unplugged. Welcome. It's great to be here. Thanks. Yeah, well, I am just as we were talking pre-show, I am so thrilled uh, to get into so many range of topics. And uh, as I was teasing you, I don't know if it was, uh, you're like kind of maybe, what was the guy, Ian Malcolm or whatever, like in Jurassic Park? Right, that's right. Yeah, I get that. If I get my beard on, I get Michael Stipe. You know, but yeah, those are my... Uh... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So, you know, if this gig at Michigan doesn't work out for you, you've got an acting career ahead of you. I can always be a mathematical extra, you know, if they need someone to step in and do math on the board. Or oh, something. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be... I don't really want to cool. be a stunt guy. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Better to be a mathematical expert. I agree. Uh, 
Yeah, the insurance is just too, you can't get insurance, I don't think, as a stock guy. I don't think so. Not in my age. Yeah. Well, uh, as I said, you know, uh, stumble upon your work is of things that I was involved with. And I am so delighted that you uh, jumped to the chance because I was just so impressed with a lot of the work that you did. For my audience, I always love to just get a little bit of background on the person whom I'm talking with, even if I've known them for years. It's just really great to hear a person's journey. Like uh, maybe you could give us a little bit in a three by five, uh, your story uh, and how you got to the place that you are today. Yeah, so just really briefly, you know, I was an uh, undergrad at the University of Michigan, majored in math, you know, started getting a PhD in math. And at this time in the 80s, game theory was becoming a new discipline. So I sort of then went and got a PhD at Northwestern learning game theory. And then when I took my first job at Caltech, complexity theory was just coming in. And so in my mind was this just really interesting juxtaposition of sort of complexity models that were new, game theory models that were new, and then standard kind of neoclassical economics that was sitting out there. And as I tried to make sense of those three ways of thinking about the world, I realized, and which one should win, right? Where should I sort of cast my lot? I realized the correct answer was yes, all three. And, <laughs> the way, and the way to really make sense of the world was to, to try to hold multiple models in your head at the same time. And then very quickly you realize, well, I'm just not that smart. And so that the right way to do this is to have teams of people who have different ways of thinking in a very formal sense, right? You know, so people who bring really different frameworks to bear on complex problems. And so what's been exciting about this is that um, I mean, you can really think of the last 20 years and I think the next 50 years is really, you know, the age of complexity, right? You think like 40, 50 years ago, there was kind of this sort of, you know, Hayekian Friedman notion that firms should maximize profits. And I think now we're seeing, okay, but they should be sustainable and they should have good governments and they should promote equality. And, you know, you think of the sustainable development goals, managing in 16 dimensions is not easy. And so you've got to think about the world in a lot of ways. And so that's kind of the space I play in. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And, um, and what, what was it about it though, initially that uh, you said that attracted you, maybe we could explore that a little bit further. Like, what was it that said, oh, this is really uh, quite interesting to me. And I think, uh, you know, it's something that I would really help to add value in. So I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, I, I've been trained in mathematics. And so I came into economics, um, kind of understanding a lot of the math that was being used to derive sort of standard welfare theorems about why markets are efficient. And so that made me a little bit more dubious then about, you know, what was what I was being taught, just in the sense that I thought, well, you know, this is, yes, this mathematics would show this, but a different mathematics might show something different. And I remember, you know, some people like, you know, John Holland, who's a colleague of mine at Michigan, Ken Arrow, um, who's at Stanford, Brian Arthur at Stanford would say things like, you know, if you took one look at the economy, if you could choose one word to describe the economy or the business world, would you choose, or the political world, would you choose equilibrium or would you choose complex? Mm. And to me, that seems fairly straightforward. You'd choose complex. And yet that's not completely right in the sense that um, if I have, imagine the following, imagine I have a, a dog chasing a rabbit in my backyard, right? So the rabbit's sitting there, the dog goes for the rabbit, the rabbit moves, the dog goes for the rabbit again. An appropriate way to model that or think about that might be as a sequence of equilibrium. There's a random shock, R for rabbit, it moves. D for dog deterministically goes towards the new random shock, the new equilibrium, rabbit moves again. And so there's this then deep question of when is it best to model something as an equilibrium that occasionally has random shocks and recalibrates as economists tend to do. And or when is it best to model things as a dynamical system and a complex dynamical system, um, which is what epidemiologists might do, people studying mm. traffic might do. Like you don't want to model traffic as a sequence of equilibrium, <laughs> right? I mean, that's pushed a little bit too far. And so then there's a, you know, so, and so I just really got intrigued by um, this question of you've got a set of, whether you're looking at ants or neurons or people or firms, you have these sort of purposive entities, agents at a micro level that then collectively produce macro level phenomena. And then we respond to that macro level phenomena. Now, in some cases, those things are gonna to move to equilibria. And so I can write down a simple model like where you're choosing which, you know, what order you go do things at, um, at work, like when you go to the grocery store, when you go to this and you'll see that like, boom, those systems just quickly you know, equilibrate, right? Because if the place right. is too busy, you go someplace else. 
but then I can, if I break down a model like, you know, oil prices where you can store tankers outside, there's pipelines there, you know, that's going to be incredibly complex. And so I think one of the really fun things is when you think about, and one of the things I spend a lot of time when I talk to organizations about in the context of sort of diversity and using lots of different models to make sense of the world is the first question you want to ask is, is this complex or is this relatively simple? And if it's relatively simple, you don't need diversity. You don't need to, you know, um, you just need to really follow your process carefully. But as, as you sort of turn that complexity knob, uh, that's when you have to start thinking about who do we need in the room? What are the different ways of thinking about this? What are our blind spots? Because we're not gonna, no individual or no process is gonna have the capacity necessarily up to the task of understanding the system. Yeah, so you were going where I thought you'd, uh, where I was gonna ask you actually, just yeah. give some basis on what, what do we mean by complexity? So you sure. sort of define that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which, yeah. Which, was, which was very helpful because what I'm curious about is then, what are the sort of um, factors that distinguish something that's simple? Because it's almost hard to imagine these days what is really simple because there's always, it seemingly feels like there's some interdependence or other sort of in actors that are interacting with one another, but maybe not. So, so I think you, I think it's a great sort of start where you, you say, well, is this simple? Is this complex? But right. I, I'm wondering if you could maybe, uh, define each of those a little bit different so that people understand maybe the, the subtle differences between the two. Absolutely. So, I mean, there's, a, there's an irony here, right? You can't have a simple definition of complex, but there's, <laughs> there's, there's, instead there's two broad classes of definition. So the first broad class comes from statistics and physics. And what it does is it says, let's look at a data stream. So if your listeners were to just pull up oil prices and oil production or copper prices and copper production, any commodity, what you'll see is the production of oil and the production of copper is kind of linearly increasing. You could, you, mm -hmm. you could predict that with a linear function, you know, maybe, you know, a couple little shifts, but it's straightforward. Prices, meanwhile, are kind of all over the place. And so statistically, the way we distinguish complexity there is what I call BOAR, B-O-A-R, for between ordered and random. And this is an idea that comes from Murray Gelman. Mm. If something's ordered or simple, like linear, it's not complex. And on the other hand, if it's completely random, like a, you know, then it's not complex either. So one interesting thing is like, you know, if you think of efficient market theory in economics, right, you would get that stock prices will be random and they're very close to random. And so we would say, even though it's a complex process that's producing those prices, the price stream itself is close enough to random that you really wouldn't call it complex. So complex would mean statistically in this class of definition, that there's some structure there, there's some higher order patterns, there's things that are somewhat predictable, maybe at least in the short term, right? And there's information content in there, right? Where something is completely random, that's right. just random. Second class of definition I call deep, which is, and this is in my book, Diversity and Complexity, which is D-E-E-P, there's an extra E in there. And this is something that's difficult to engineer, evolve, um, explain or predict, right? So if I look at like, you know, the drug, you know, the new COVID drugs, those are very difficult to engineer. If mm -hmm. I look at the eye, that's was extremely difficult to evolve, right? There's been a lot of work on how did the, you know, um, how did it uh, evolve? If you want to try and explain, if I want to explain what's going on in Ukraine right now, right? That would take a long time, right? And if I want to predict, which goes back to the sort of statistical notion, um, that's also going to be hard to do, right? And so, and so, what you think of when you when you take the second class of definitions, imagine a black box that's producing a data stream. That black box, if that's difficult to, if you can imagine, boy, that was difficult to evolve, explain, predict, engineer. You think of that as being a complex system. The first class of definition is saying, in the thing being pushed out of that complex system, um, simple. And so, right. you can get caught up in, you know, complex systems often have higher order emergent stuff. So the fabulous work by my former colleague, Charlie Plott at Caltech, Vernon Smith, who won a Nobel Prize for this in Arizona, on like markets have this amazing ability to build order out of an incredibly complex, but you get this equilibrium price, right? So the process itself could be difficult to explain, but not difficult to predict, right? right. So you don't want to get caught up in the, whoa, this thing, you know, this thing's incredibly complex. You want to ask, what is the thing 
we're trying to make sense of is that complex, right? Because almost everything's got complex underpinnings, but sometimes you can just ignore it, right? If I go down to the quantum level, <laughs> everything's kind of hard to make sense of. Well, yeah, right. yeah. That, that I read a story. I forget who authored that infinite regression, um, upward escalation, right. it, the warning of the doorknob. You know, you're trying to you know f figure out a problem, and that you could either go in, uh, regress into thinking about metallurgical principles and the construction of a doorknob, or you can think of why do we even need doorknobs to begin with to, to you know, open up and close doors? You know, maybe we right. need some other sort of bureaucratic system to, you know, we have no doors, you know? So defining the problem, you know, sometimes can, it sounds like uh, it's, it, it, there's a whole range of choices, but that what you described there is, I don't know. It sounds like there's a little bit uh, a sizing up first, right? So sure, I think on, on two dimensions. So one is like, how deep do you go? And so let's think of like, you know, um, you know, synthetic oil, synthetic oil got created because like suddenly they could break down carbon chains in a way they couldn't. So you could go kind of a level deeper in the, you know, creation of lubricants. If you think about sort of like, you know, how economists now think of social policy, now we're sort of broadening the set of things we consider. Right. Like, what is their social network? That's what, so there's this, constant sort of, you know, you know, pulling the accordion out in terms of considering more variables and this constant sort of like, you know, you know, as technology develops, you know, sort of like looking through a finer microscope. So there's this kind of weird microscope telescope aspect to things. And I think when you're making a business decision, a lot of it, you know, you're talking about everything's interdependent. Um, when I try and teach like what causes complexity to um, like undergraduates or even like high school students, like if you go buy a loaf of bread, that has, you know, an externality to me in the sense that it might raise the price of bread just a tiny, tiny bit, right? But the thing is, but that system has enough sort of negative feedbacks that, you know, they, they may then go make more bread and the price will go back sure. down. It's just going to be fine. But if we're, um, let's suppose you're North Korea and I'm Iran and you say, hey, I'll sell you some nuclear weapons for some oil, right? a whole bunch of people who weren't party to that transaction and are materially affected. And they've got to then take actions to respond to that. And so it really comes down to like, what's this, you know, what's the shape and the magnitude and, the, and who are the number of people affected or, you know, actors affected by some sort of action, right? Y yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So again, I think it's, it's uh, there's an initial sort of framing of that. Um, and, and I think what you talked about there too, um, maybe you can you can also define uh, what I'm trying to grasp is the you know the difference between sort of what might seemingly be random that there's no right it's no relationship right. at all right. versus something that does have some kind of relationships even though maybe on the surface like you just described arms versus oil you might say right. well, you know how do you reconcile those two things right. Um, and, and I, I don't know if I'm, I'm, do, I'm now I'm going to show my sort of novice, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, chaos is there's a more specific relationship to something, right? Um, even though yeah. it's, even though it appears random. Right. And there's, I mean, this is, I mean, you're opening up, like, there's sort of a giant can of worms here. So let me put this in sort of like two different camps. So one is, is that you could think about like, you know, Taleb has written on, you know, fooled by randomness. There's a question of like, you know, we often can see patterns in things when in fact, in reality, there's, you know, there is no pattern. So humans have a tendency to see, see patterns that don't exist. But when you think about randomness, we can imagine, there's a question of where does this, where does it come from, right? Now you can imagine, like if you think of it like a normal distribution of randomness, you assume that, well, there's just a bunch of things like, like how many people show up at this, you know, particular park on a given Saturday, you can imagine there's, 3,000 people that live in the neighborhood of the park, each one makes a random decision to go. So that means that, you know, you get this nice normal distribution of the number of the people that show up. And if I'm running a standard business, like a grocery store or something like that, and each person's decision is independent, I'll get a normal curve. But if there's interdependence, like if I join this website or listen to this podcast, because other people listen to this podcast, I lose that independence assumption. And then I start getting longer tail distributions, right? That mm -hmm. becomes sort of mm -hmm. difficult yeah. to predict. Um, the I think one of the real challenges is any randomness we see in a market, in society, really is an aggregation of a whole bunch of micro level things that are often decisions of individuals or decisions of firms. And 
if you, or if you're looking at, let's, let's take another sort of extreme example. Like let's suppose I'm, I develop a molecule that I'm gonna then go do testing on. And the way testing currently works is we, we sort of say, okay, how many people is this effective for? How many was it not? And we have this kind of like really randomness mindset. We do, so we do like a hypothesis test, you know, was the percentage of people who were improved bigger than we'd accepted from the placebo, right? right. But what's intriguing here, and this is, I think this really at the core of the distinction between sort of complexity and randomness is that I think a lot of people, when they read those things, they think, oh, there's just random effects on all these people right? It like randomly worked or not, as though everyone just flipped the die. But the reality is that's a specific molecule doing a specific thing. And any individual person has an underlying genetic structure, has, you know, sort of epigenetic phenotype, and then is making sort of individual decisions that could interact with that drug. So the drug is going to interact, the molecule is going to interact with our genome, our phenome, and our choices, and our ability to sort of maybe possibly follow a protocol. And so, there's nothing really random about who that drug was worked for and who it didn't work for. It's actually probably, you know, very well, aside from like quantum stuff, it's probably very sort of deterministic, but in an incredibly high dimensional space. And so if you think about like bespoke molecules in a way, like, you know, just like, you know, you're going to have a drug that's going to work for me, just like somebody's going to pick out the shirt that works perfectly for me. Right. Um, you know, I think a lot of people in pharma are thinking about, you know, that, that sort of thing is it's moving away from sort of this randomness mindset to a to a complexity mindset the question is you know can we you know can we understand how the complexity is producing the differential impact right yeah well so all right so let me test that assumption so let's yeah. do something a little bit more basic it, it, let's say if you're talking about uh the consumer product so i, I understand right. that in, the, in, in terms of complex epidemiological, you know, yeah, and, right. uh, you know, uh, ways from a life science perspective, but what about in terms of just consumer brands? So look, what you see a lot of these days is companies, uh, one of the ways uh, um, they can grow is through aggregation of other assets. So they start buying up other company like companies in their industry or adjacent industries. And, and, and all of a sudden they, uh, you know, Again, they're wanting the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts, but they've got all these parts, right? And, and they're trying to wrestle with trying to figure out how do they create a sort of on the whole level, systemic level, uh, a successful, growing, profitable brand and organization, but at the same time, have some appreciation or, or um, differentiation between one sub brand between another. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, how did, how does that work in, in, in something like that where, <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. I mean, I, without, without sort of naming names, you know, several companies I've worked with recently have done reorgs where what they've done is they've asked the question, you know, do, so let's go back to very old sort of like Chandler M form versus U form. Yeah. Like, you know, do you divide by process or do you divide by product? Right? right. And one of the things I think is happening, which is fascinating is that people are starting to, I mean, you know, there's now matrix organizations and stuff, but realizing that like you're more technical people, like your data science people, your engineering people, it almost makes sense to put them in a, in a process camp. So let's suppose, for example, I'm running, I've got a portfolio of drugs, molecules I'm looking at, or I've got a portfolio of consumer products, right? Or I've got a portfolio of schools, if I'm, you know, the mm. New York City public schools. And what I do is before I might've had like, you know, a data science person in each one of those groups, you know, looking at like, how is the school performing or, you know, subsets of schools or, you know, how are Ritz crackers performing in the market or how is, you know, if I'm ABI, you know, how, who's buying Stella Artois, that sort of thing, like within the brand or like each, each team within a big pharma, you know, you know, to place like Genentech, they might be like, somebody might be doing the data on that particular molecule. What I'm seeing is a movement towards like grouping those people together, like having a giant data science team, making that a cost center, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Um, as opposed to, you know, just someone is, and then you, because there's just, you can learn so much across brands. So let's think about, you know, let's suppose you're a yum brands or something like that. They would be missing a real opportunity if they're not sort of gathering data from all of their different, you know, rest, you know the different restaurant chains that they run, products that they own. 
and thinking about, okay, you know, let's try and identify synergies. Let's try and identify, you know, patterns in um, what consumers have. And let's, I mean, sitting out there is, you know, the lunchable is always sitting out there. You know I mean? Like right. when Kraft and Oscar Mayer merged, right? And we had a little get together and they realized like, you know, we have, we're selling crackers, you're selling cheese and meats, you know, people put those things together. Why don't we just do that for them? Right. And uh, that's been a, I mean, again, I don't know the, I don't know the financials on that, but I can say just from like walking in a supermarket, financial must be pretty good because those things are. Oh, sure. And, and, and then has all sorts of other implications like, uh, you know, hummus and, you know, pretzels, right? So, and, and it influences the package design, you know, and the convenience of that. And like you said, it's helping consumer, you know, we've put it together for them, right? It's interesting. Uh, it's also, I mean, the, the Lunchables is a fascinating example because like M&M Mars came on board, right? And so, you know, that's privately held. They're, you know, very reluctant to do brand extension typically. And so, so that's a signal that this must have worked. Um, <laughs> it must be working really well. But the, uh, but I think you're right. Like this, the, there, when we think of, there's different words that different disciplines use. So economists will say externalities, you know, biologists will say epistasis, right? Drug, people make drugs, we'll talk about interaction effects. But what we're really talking about is, and, so, and, and we want to distinguish between like people will say nonlinear. Nonlinear means not aligned. So like, you know, diminishing returns is nonlinear. Increasing returns is nonlinear. But we're not, we're talking about is John Holland used to, or John von Neumann one time said, the study of nonlinear functions, is, that's like saying the study of non-elephants. You know, it's like <laughs> everything's done. So what we're really talking about is interdependencies. And what you want is you want it, if you, if you have multiple brands, if they're competing against each other, that's a negative interdependency, right? right? If you can come up with something like Lunchables or put the pretzels with the hummus, that's a positive interdependency, right? And so I think when you think the metaphor that people use in complex systems all the time, and this comes from biology, is... Um, and this was this guy named Sewell, a rugged landscape. So imagine yes. high dimensional space and you're kind of climbing that landscape. Right. What you're doing is, um, you know, and this is where it gets, the metaphor is incredibly powerful because it, it gets across several things. One is um, this notion of locality. There's things that you can, you're, you're kind of in a particular spot and you can see locally really well. You can't see a long way away really well, right? The other thing is, is that organizationally or structurally, it may be hard to move. So evolution doesn't allow us to take big leaps, right? So um, people always joke, you know, that like, oh, like my child is perfect. You know, they're bored. Oh, she's perfect. And I'll, and I'll be like, do they have a blowhole? You know, because a blowhole would be a lot better. We wouldn't get virus. Like there would be no virus if we just had blowholes. We could wear square little yarmulkes. We'd all be fine. Um, <laughs> you know, eating and breathing through the same hole is a really bad design. Right, this is terrible. I mean, I'm there. David Kelly could tell you that he was on. Yeah, yeah. Idea yeah. Would say idea would figure that out in about thirty seconds, yeah. but we do, and it would be that's a that's a hill too far to get to. Right. Um, the other thing about the landscape metaphor that's so fascinating to me, and this is where the diversity stuff comes in, is people can see things differently. So if you represent the world differently than me, mm. right then I may, what's, what's close for you on the landscape may be far, far away for me. And so, you, and so the, when you think about like groups of people then solving a problem, it's kind of a mistake to think about like who's smarter, right? Well, let's get the smart people in the room. You want people who can represent a problem, right? Um, you know, in, in very, very different ways because they might see big differences. So, you know, an example at a conference I was at, and this is David Griffith, who's a math professor of mine, was at a traffic conference and people had all these like traffic models and they, you know, they're modeling cars on the road and then there's in a traffic jam, there's very few spaces between the cars. They're talking about how long it takes these computer programs to run. But David works in discrete mathematics sometimes. And so he thinks of things in zeros and ones. And so he's looking at this as that he goes, he goes, he just raises his hand and said, why don't you model the non-cars instead of the cars? And there's like silence, but think about it. Like you've got, so I've got this computer program. I've got like a whole bunch of ones and only a few zeros. And I'm passing that through memory all the time. Right. right? Instead, I could just say there's a non-car in spot five. 
right? Instead of saying there's a car in every single car, you know, instead of passing, if there's a, if there are a thousand spots for cars and 998 had cars in them, rather than passing 998 pieces of information, I could pass two. But better than that, the mathematics on the empty spaces is actually much easier. Yeah, it's a greater level of efficiency. Yeah, and so, you know, when you think about that, how do I, you know, well, so so just so how do you then in those situations see so you had somebody kind of intervene and had that perspective. So let's say you're working with a group of executives right. to come to that sort of same sort of conclusion. How do you get them to reframe that? Because I think the tendency is, yeah, let's model all the cars, which right. is so many more inputs and so much more d- data, presumably so much more processing and computing power that has to calculate all of that. So how do you get to that? Yeah. that so yeah, this is the thing that I, I'm, to be honest, I've, I've spent a lot of time, you know, sort of trying to, to make sense of, and I, I don't, I think I have ideas and conjectures, but I don't fully know how to make sense of them. So let's, let's suppose I'm trying to decide uptake on whether it's a vaccine, a new product, you know, um, listening to, you know, any, any kind of like new thing. One could tell a purely, one could write down a purely economic model and say, what are, what are people's sort of values, preferences, goals, those sorts of things. What are the attributes of my products? Who's buying my product? Who's not buying my product? Who's uptaking? And do a do a, a purely choice based analysis of you know who's buying, who's not. I could do A/B testing, changing features, and try to in some sense climb the landscape that way. But that would be very much just sort of a what we would call sort of a methodological individualistic, you know, kind of rational agent model of you know why why someone buys. Mm-hmm. Alternatively, <clears throat> I might go with a much more sociological, um, you know, notion. Think about, okay, you know, you know, to what extent, you know, what neighborhoods are people in? You know, what religion are they? You know, I mean, even though this might be variables, I think I might be thinking much more that this is this product or these decisions are being made collectively. You know, so are we seeing correlations in who's doing it? Um, and have much more sort of a, you know, because people always joke that economists are sort of like how and why people make choices. Sociologists tend to think people don't have any choices they can make, right? That you're sort of born in the role of Mercutio and then you, have to, you know, recite those lines, right? No, and there's stories like, you, you know, people will tell stories in management classes about how, you know, they, they walk into an office and there's um, M&Ms on the receptionist's desk and you ask him like, oh, why do you put the M&Ms here? And he's like, I don't know, the person who had this job before me did. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um, and I think that there's, and so I think that, one could imagine then constructing a purely, you know, sort of sociological model. One could also construct a much more sort of epidemiological model in terms of that this is all just people like copying other people for, you know, purely kind of like almost like random ways and just asking, are we, you know, is this passing over a network and, and that sort of thing. So I think that there's, um, and, and so when you think about like trying to understand why some phenomenon is happening, you want to have this sort of like, you know, parliament of models. Now, Here's the challenge though, and this is the thing I've worked on with a philosopher, Elaine Landemore, a little bit. You know, if you were trained for 20 years in consumer behavior, and I'm trained for 20 years as an economist on how people make choices, and somebody else is trained for 20 years in like psychological biases, and we get in a room, we're not going to have some magical mind meld in 30 minutes. That's going to be a really, you know, there's going to be jargon issues. There's, you know, how I represent the world may be completely different than than you do and it's not clear we're gonna like we can't mold all those models together into some giant model that's going to be perfect because it'd be overfit and so i so i think one of the real questions you want to have when you think about making these decisions is what frameworks are at the table and i think you know so people will say how many frameworks should we have at the table and my answer is always not one <laughs> right because so let's go back to what we talked about with complexity so complexity typically means you know, it's sort of difficult to explain evolving. So it's got lots of parts. Those parts are diverse. They interact in complex ways. So, you know, you could pull up, there's a wonderful graph called, you know, the foresight obesity graph, which you could sort of insert in. And it shows all the different causes of obesity characterized by is it sociological, is it genetic, is it due to exercise, is it due to social, you know, is it, you know, what are all the, and that's a giant map. No one person understands that whole map, but, but an economist, a public health person, a sociologist, looks through different frames. So you can imagine almost putting like an old, when I explain this, I'll say, imagine, remember those old computer punch out cards? Yes. Kind of like a sociologist punch out card. So think of those giant like spaghetti maps. 
The sociologist has a punch out card and they look through that. The economist looks through theirs. The public health person looks through. So each one, you know, to, to quote Joseph Conrad, right, doesn't see the full show. Right, right. So, blind man and the elephant. Right. Yeah, but the, but the thing is, but they but it's it's a higher dimensional view of that because there is overlap in what they see, right? So instead of instead of an elephant with seven parts, you've got a map with a hundred parts, and then you want to think about okay, which ones of those do we can matter? That's one question. Which one of those can we actually move in a meaningful way, right? You know, so which which lies in our sort of like domain of authority. And or which we have agency over, and then what you want to think about is like you know maybe the sociologist frame is completely irrelevant, and maybe the public health frame really. And and but the other but the point I want to make is, you can't have eleven frames in the room all looking at different things because the conversation just isn't gonna, you know, it, it's going to be a mess. And so one, but you can over time, sort of bring in more frames. So if you think about like the Federal Reserve, you know, board, which I've done some work with. Right, like having all economists is a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. You want to have some sociologist, you want to have one. Um, and, and I think you've seen this with, you know, firms have recognized this, right? That you want to have, you know, you want to have people who understand the psychology of consumers. You want to people who understand the sociology of consumers. You want to people who think like economists, right? You want to have those multiple frames in there, but you have to build, um, my friend Uma Jayakumar, and I call this kind of like diversity human capital, in a way, in the sense of you have to build this capacity to listen to other people who see the world differently than you see the world. Here's the simple example I love to give. You're driving down the road, got kids in the back, they're starving, right? You stop at this little ga roadside gas station. The only thing in there that you could possibly buy for your kid to eat is a green apple. You know, everything else is like, you know, no way. And, but you look at the green apple and your frame is, it's an apple. He's going right. to eat it. Your partner's frame is it's green. Our kids eat nothing that is green. Yeah, right, right, right. And so the thing is, but the thing is, you can then talk through it and say it's an apple, but it's green. And then you figure out, peel it. We've solved this, right? But if we're having a conversation about like how we categorize things, and you're a philosopher and you say, oh, I think we're all suffering from the myth of the given here. And I say, oh, and I'm a, you know, a data scientist. And I say that um, I think, you know, that, you know, we need to have orthogonal, you know, we need to do factor analysis and we, as we need to do clustering analysis with unsupervised learning as opposed to factor analysis, right? What the heck, right? What is the myth of the given? What right. is unsupervised versus supervised learning? You know, and then you've just got, you don't get anywhere. But it's possible through you know longer conversations to find and building up that sort of diversity human capital and which which also applies I think not I think I'm, I know to identity diversity cultural diversity right but building up this ability to listen to people who see the world differently from yourself and even if you can't because it would be impossible to fully embrace and understand how they're thinking to somehow combine what they're thinking to identify your blind spots. So here's a simple example like yeah. from the real world in that case. Consumer products company had a, a product, they, you know, they're, they're going to release, they've done all the, you know, like based on features of that product, like how many units it should sell. For fun, they had people internal to the firm, they're running a contest on how many they're going to sell that year, right? Make predictions. Those predictions were orders of magnitude below what their model was saying which is strange, I mean, like way below, because nobody knew what the model was saying. So they went to someone and said, you know, what about, let's suppose it was a coffee mug. I don't want to say what it was. And, and um, the person said, oh, you mean that butt ugly coffee mug? <laughs> you know, butt ugly is not in the regression. I mean, regressions, you know, based on features of the product that exist, but like there's a gestalt to what the thing looked like. And the thing was ugly. And that caused them then to go back and go, whoa, we better do a redesign on this. Right. Yeah, that's where that's where I, which is what attracted me to your background. Anyhow, there's there's where does mathematics converge with social science? Right. There's a human element here that has to you factor into the causality, right, or, or uh, the the expected outcomes of certain actions. Right. You can model it numerically, something, and say, well, like ants. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. 
you know, right. but um, how much they feed uh, and how quickly they eat what they have in front of them. But if there's some other aspects, like you said, an ugly uh, mod, <laughs> right. of course, that's going to influence the, the the model altogether, right? Um, I, I love this. I, you know, I was I was thinking earlier. You also had this concept. So you talked about rugged land. Right. You you also refer to something called dancing landscapes. What right. Are, what are the differences? Yeah, so, there? You know, I wrote. I, I once wrote this paper that actually, you know, it said reasonable uptake, but it was just to try to make sense of things myself. So it, you're talking about randomness before, and I said, people will just say hard or wicked or VUCA or something like this, right? VUCA for volatility, uncertainty, right. complexity, ambiguity. And those are very different things. And so I was like, okay, what is, so uncertainty, we think about like, you know, I just don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be like, you know, so like the Super Bowl is coming up or whatever, right? The NCAA tournament is coming up, but there's a lot of randomness and I'm just uncertain. Right, stock prices. Right, it's there's it's it may be complex or random, but I, but it's it's some variable going up and down. Difficulty is is a problem that like like I've got to like build an iPhone. Like you know, it's a it's a fixed landscape where I'm climbing it, and I want to kind of solve this thing. So if it's a fixed landscape and I want to solve it, then I can put a lot of research. Like let's think about developing a drug. Right, you know, I want to. Um, I can spend a lot of time, I can have diverse teams looking at it, I can devote a lot of resources to it. And, and when I find the peak, which is the efficiency of the molecule, that's the peak, right? Or whatever peak I happen to find. Right. Um, a dancing landscape, let's suppose, uh, there's a story involving a friend of mine, I was in, um, started getting a PhD in mathematics. This will give you an interesting sense of sort of, you know, sort of interdependence. Soviet Union falls apart, right? Soviet Union had, a large number of the world's great mathematicians, because math was kind of non-ideological, completely drawing up the mathematics PhD market in the US, right? Because you could just bring in spectacular Russian mathematicians who just knew different things. So a lot of my friends went into industry and did very well, but one of them went to work for an airline and was working reorganizing, like, you know, mathematically figuring, okay, what, how should we reorganize our routes to maximize profits, right? Right. They work on this for several weeks, right before they're going to announce their new routes, their main competitor, so let's suppose he was working for American, their main competitor announced new routes. So the problem that he had solved no longer existed. <laughs> it was like the landscape he was climbing was assuming the routes of his competitors were fixed. Right. Right. And so, and so it's basically like the other, their competitor announced new routes, they'd solve the landscape that was gone. Yeah, we don't. And so this, and this is how it relates to, so, so if you have a fixed kind of like engineering problem that you can wall up and go in your room and your chalkboard and solve, that's like a standard kind of like rugged landscape, solve it. And you can spend a lot of time and devote a lot of resources. If though, you know, you're in a strategic environment where um, what you do, you know, interacts in really complicated ways or complex ways with somebody else does, your landscape's just going to go up and down like crazy. Drug development is kind of interesting there because there's a sense in which if you're developing a, you know, let's suppose a vaccine, it's almost, it can be, the landscape can just kind of shift straight up and down. Right? Sure. Like, and so sometimes when we think of these landscapes, it's helpful to think of there being a water level, which is like, if you're above water, that's going to make profits or that's going to help society. And if you're below water, it's not. And so I think one of the, so when you, when you think about it, then um, you want to think, think, okay, are we, are we above water? What's the likelihood we're above water? And what you can think, what, what it leads you then to jump to right away, you're talking about ants, is the distinction between population-based search and kind of like highly technical individual search. So you can imagine a firm that has like, you know, sort of one bet and they're like having really smart people, really talented people using the best resources they can, climbing that hill, right? You can imagine somebody else is taking a population-based method where they've just got like a whole bunch of ants spread over the landscape. And, and if the ants that are underwater drown, those that are above water, they sort of like, you know, maybe put the other ones in boats over and have them join them, right? And you're just kind of constantly, you know, using an, sort of the evolutionary idea of variation, which is you got lots of ants and then selection, killing off the bad ones and trying to continually climb. But if the landscape's dancing, you've got to continue to diversify. Yeah, so when we talked about that pre-show where there's so much em emphasis, and I'm, I'm a big fan, I, I don't know the, the um, 
scientists who studied this uh, and scientific breakthroughs over the last 50 years, you know, what were right. some of the underlying characteristics you talked about it is cognitive yeah. complexity. You know, there's a certain, you know, research scientists, you know, the more diversity that they have or exposure to different labs and different ways of thinking back to what you said earlier, you, you don't right. just bring in just one sort of point of view, you bring in multiple perspectives, but then there's also um, collaboration sort of capability that has to match that it's the two of those yeah. things to join right right so um you know so i i you know wonder um for for organizations there is a zeal you know like we we need to be more diverse we need to be more inclusive and i know from a uh, obviously from a sociological perspective in terms of right. gender race and those sort of things there's a value decision making mm -hmm. But in, in the context of just unlocking innovation promise, you know, what, what has to happen for people to consider that? Like, what are the conditions that you'd have to put in place inside of organizations to make sure that you have optimal diversity, but not so much that you can't get any kind of sort of singular point of view versus, um, you know, there's no diversity, you know, and it's very homogeneous and you get, yeah. pardon the French, a lot of shit done, but it's, you're not coming up with anything new or novel. Yeah, this is, I mean, you know, I, I moved into a, you know, just, you know, personal Christopher, I moved into a business school a couple of years ago because of the fact that I just realized this, you know, you've, you've, you know, hit the key point that there's theoretically, right. And, you know, if you write down, you know, any sort of model and, and also that empirically, if you look at the evidence, the very best groups, the very best research, the most innovative firms, all are diverse, right? The worst are as well. <laughs> so if I run a, if I plot a distribution of homogeneous, I always say, if you want to be plus, go homogeneous. Right. The, you know, so imagine like, again, if I, if I plotted homogeneous firm performance, it's going to be a tighter distribution with a slightly lower mean, but the means are about the same. If I look at heterogeneous teams, wider distribution, some are train wrecks, some are really successful. So you can look at that and say, ooh, diversity is a risk. But then if you go deeper and you get to, you know, the kind of stuff work that you do and you think, okay, how do I motivate my team? How do I get a shared sense of mission, right? How do I define problems? How large do I make my teams? What problems do I have them work on? What's my organizational culture? Like all this sort of, you know, this kind of science and art of management. It's well-managed teams that, give you those A pluses and it's too much diversity, different alignment, different goals, lack of trust, all the sort of things that can cause organizational failure. So I think of, you know, management when everybody came from, like everybody went to the same schools and everybody, you know, it's all men, it's a lot easier, but you're not gonna get as much interesting stuff, right? You're not gonna get this, that than if you have people who went to different schools, come from different backgrounds, trained in different ways, but it's gonna be harder to manage. The evidence though on this, you know, I wanna be super clear is, so overwhelming. If you look at, this is, you know, Brian Uzi and uh, Ben Jones and um, Sarah Mukherjee's work at Northwestern, look at every academic paper ever published. So this isn't 30 people in the lab one day, look, I showed right. this, you know, turn it over. This is every piece of research ever published. Look at every patent ever issued. You see data, like in the case of the papers, team authored papers are four and a half times as likely to get a hundred citations as individual authored papers in mean, four and a half fold. And if you unpack it, what really drives these um, team authored papers being better is two things, ability, right? People tend to choose, like you don't tend to choose other people to work with unless they're good, right? right. And the other thing is diversity in terms of, and so how do they measure diversity? They have what they call atypical combinations. So what happens is, is that like you're a management consultant, I'm a mathematical complex systems person, we go together and like voila, we get really, great stuff so because they're bringing different literally different toolboxes to the table so you want to think it, i always say toolbox is not measuring sticks right mm -hmm. um you know you, you want people with different toolboxes but they can't be too far apart and so good work involves people who published good stuff that got published in the past and bring different tools now dash and wang also at northwestern you always, you always have the younger faculty come in and then like unpack it even better. Dasha was recently put out a full press, a great guy. He looked at this data in more detail and said, whoa, it's actually even more interesting than that. Breakthrough stuff, disruptive stuff is small diverse teams, right? Like it's Kahneman and Tversky, you know, it's, it's handfuls of people 
who had time to deeply sit down and figure stuff out, right? And, and break through that diversity barrier thing. That's one half of the sort of why teams are better. The other half of why teams are better is they're big teams that once something's been kind of figured out to really develop idea and carry it through in the right way requires diverse teams. So I was at a, just a spectacular talk yesterday um, by a, a political scientist at UCLA mm -hmm. looking at sort of like, you know, the spread of features of democracy. And to do this work well, it involves, you know, somebody who historically understands what's going on demographically, it requires people who can read constitutions in different languages. And then once you've got this massive data set, like to have this work well, you're gonna want people who are sort of experts in kind of like new age data science with networks and clustering and those sort of things. You're also gonna want people who are like good at kind of like standard econometricy kind of stuff. And you're also gonna want people who you know study dynamical systems and epidemics because this is, you know, cause he's got like these kind of like, you know, you know, like democracy literally spreads not unlike COVID is spread. And so to really, you know, make a project like that to develop it, what Dashun has shown, then you suddenly have these big teams. And so it's really fascinating. That, like, so teams are better at coming up with ideas and teams are better at fleshing out ideas and they've got to be diverse teams. And so I always joke that, yeah, you know, we know three things when we compare teams to individuals on difficult and complex tasks. First one is teams win. Second one is teams win. Third one is teams win. It's teams, teams, teams. I mean, it's just, there is, it's, there's so much better, but it's also the case, right? That you want those teams to be comprised of good people. So again, Tetlock and I were both involved in something with IARPA and Barb Mellers and some other people, a bunch of other people, you know, making these predictions. So tens of thousands of people made all these predictions. It was funded by the government. And what you found is there's a set of people that Phil in his book calls super forecasters that are already like 30, 40% better at making decisions, making forecasts than individuals. But then if you team those forecasters and you kind of train them out of their cognitive biases and you aggregate them in another way, you get another 40% lift. Yeah, yeah. This no, is, I, I... Yeah, this is like, and so, like, you know, when I look at this, it's like there's baseline, there's talent and there's diversity and then diverse talent working well together is, you know, I mean, I always like to say it's simple and it's freakishly complex. Yeah, <laughs> you know, no, no, no. Because the, the takeaway is simple. Right. Yeah, back in the back in the day, I used to use a, I think it was a company named Human Synergistics that uh, it was based okay. on uh, scientific, uh, you know, explorers, you know, people who are world class expedition type people who've survived yeah. from Arctic to you know desert to uh, to the jungles, and I, I'll never forget there they had basically it's a variation on this, the same theme, but that they had this simple tool that they uh, simulate. You know, if you were in a traumatic situation, you were stuck in a desert or, or jungle or, or in some Arctic conditions. Uh, if you do, you make the decisions on which of the items are the most useful right. for your success. Um, you know, there are some who are just like brilliant; they get a, the best score. But inevitably, it is the group score that always outperforms. That was just, it was such a profound sort of awareness of it. But obviously getting to that end point is what you alluded to is the art. What, what is the sort of management tool and the disciplines and the conditions that either as leaders or organizations put in place to ensure that you do that uh, as effectively, right? So to produce the best outcome and efficiently at the same time, right? Because at some point, and I've been, and I have helped facilitate many a team in right. my lifetime to know that sometimes uh, the, or the, the group is very efficient, but they come up with a really crummy idea or other times they just can't come to consensus on anything and, uh, and they you know, lose momentum or they disband. Yeah, and I think there's, I mean, a point you're getting at, which is, I think you know, when you think about organizational culture, um, you know, one thing you might, I think that works well, at least, you know, anecdotally, but I know that um, it's had a positive impact when I talk to people who've implemented it is asking people to say, like, if you think you're making a really important decision, right? If you think this is, boy, this, this one really matters. Then the next question you wanna ask is, who from outside my silo should I go grab a coffee with? Because if it's a really big decision, two things probably are in play. One is it probably intersects with other parts of the firm, with the organization, right? So that's 
a reason that is reason alone to go. And the other is, well, you probably really want another perspective because again, let's go back to the computer card thing. Your set of life experiences, your trading is a punch card with a certain number of windows in it. And right. there might be a window, the, you know, the, the ugly mug window might be one that you're just completely missing because you know, you've been an engineer and aesthetics haven't been you know, part of your concern, right? Or like, you know, another example, this one I think is, is you know, public information, when flat screen TVs first came out and they just got a lot bigger, there were linear models of how much people like bigger TVs, but at some point um, it just blew up. Like, like, yeah, I like a 40 inch TV a little bit better than a 38 inch TV. But the thing is a 60 inch TV, right. is like a life changing event. Like I can, I can afford a, you know, and so, you know, all of a sudden I can afford that. I'm just buying that. And then I'm gonna come home, my husband and their wife's gonna be like, what the hell did you eat? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but the thing is, is that the, uh, um, and so I think that there's, there's things where, um, you know, not, we might not be aware of non-linearities, big events, things like, you know, again, blind spots um, because of the complexity of the, like what might seem like a good idea might not be a good idea, right? And you look at things like, I mean, the Ford, the new Ford F-150 electric truck, right? You know, Ford has super talented people there. And I, I think it's fair to say, based on things we've heard in the last few weeks, is that they're just blown away by the demand, right? I mean, they basically, your, their orders are two years in advance, right? And I'll say this, even though it's an Ohio State fan, it's typical for me to bring it up, but like an Ohio State fan <laughs> was quoted yesterday in the paper saying, look, this is a better truck for my work. And I'm sure like that, they figured that out, right? I can do things, but he goes, but look at this, man. I go to Ohio State games and I tailgate, I can plug in my smoker, I can plug in my big screen TV. Like, you know, I, I think they, they thought of, yeah, okay, people will use this for these two things, but like, I just don't think they fully understood this is a whole new thing, right? I mean, suddenly like the, my truck is a power station. Right. right? <laughs> um, and so I don't think, you know, no single linear model based on torque and miles per gallon or whatever, right, is going to sort of give you a sense of demand. Lucky for them, it's huge, right? Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, but then, but then there's, but then that's going to, this is going to have implications for solar industry, all sorts of other stuff, right? Yeah, God, that is so, that is so fun, fun that you said that. Maybe we'll have another conversation at some point. You just, this is talk about uh, sort of random, like, I'd like to understand the phenomena of tailgate parties to begin with, you know, what that's all about. <laughs> that's a, that's a interesting sort of social phenomena. Uh, it's, right. No, and then it's, and it's, the, it's like the, it's weird because it's like, you know, camping, like, you know, right. in England, like caravanning is like such a big thing. And it's, it's just funny how much we like love going and being in, you know, it's like tiny house thing. Like, like I think it's right. in small doses. It's really, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's also a way to be welcoming. The thing about tailgate, I think is that I find so wonderful is that it's a way to be incredibly, you know, welcoming and, and yet, you know, yeah. Yeah. And you yeah. don't have to clean your house to do it. Right. right. There's no, there's no sense in which anybody's invading your personal space and right. And so I think it's, um, I think, and so I think there's just a lot of reasons why it, it plays out well. Yeah. Wow. Scott, this has been, this is awesome and amazing. Before we kind of conclude a couple of things, first of all, where can people find out more about the work that you're doing, uh, things that you're publishing? You've got some great programs online that I think people should uh, really check out. Um, so could you uh, direct my audience to getting to know Scott Page? Better? Yeah, so, so really briefly, you know, started, starting from the, the base again for the, the teaching company, which is like, you know, that we used to be called the great professors on tape. I did a, a couple of courses for them on like, kind of like, what is complexity? So if you want like kind of, you know, nice intros to complexity, that's great. In the sort of identity diversity space, I have two books, one called The Difference and one called The Diversity Bonus. The Difference is kind of a much more mathematical one. The Diversity Bonus is an airport book. And then I have a new book out, The Model Thinker, which is really right. kind of goes it. deep on kind of how we use these models from a management standpoint to make things work. In terms of you know where I play, you know, and, and think and who I hang out with, Santa Fe Institute has a you know business network. I do a lot of stuff with them. They have a lot of interesting program. And then through having moved to Ross, the business school at Michigan, we're trying to, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff there, you know, sort of 
we've, we've both got good general programs, but we're really working on trying to like, you know, create some very specific programs that deal with, you know, you know, force organizations like, you know, organizational change, um, you know, dealing with complexity. One of the things that Michigan's, and again, this is a case of the synergy. Michigan has historically been really, really good on like sort of positive organizational change. You have the Center for Positive Organizational Studies. Yeah. Why it's so like, you know, how a positive culture and open culture is so, so important. What I'm trying to figure out is how can I add, you know, exactly what we talked about with great research. How can I add my understanding of sort of the value of complexity and diversity in teams to create that synergies with the sort of positive stuff? And we have a great new hire, Lindy Greer, mm. who does some of this stuff with me. And we're, we're you know, so we're, we're, we're still, we're not underwater on the landscape, but we're barely above, you know, we're, we're getting there. We're trying to, there, there's a there there. Yeah. Um, conceptually, and we see successes. There's some companies that we've worked with that have just done amazingly well. And, you know, and people like yourself in this, you know, consulting space, you know, we see them, you know, I meet so many people saying, you know, boy, here's a case where this, we really got this working. We got these like sort of teams of different people solving these incredibly hard problems and, and it just, and it worked. And so turning anecdote to process, right. And the role that kind of like, you know, some sort of scientific understanding can help us understand um, how we make that transition. No process is going to work perfectly and process is going to vary depending on context. But boy, I'm, you know, I think at Santa Fe, at Ross, at Michigan, I think you'll see in my book, The Model Thinker, how I, I'm struggling with this. I think we're all struggling with this, but it's, a, you know, it's a good struggle. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it is. Because, yeah, no, I, 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 those are great resources, and I like the, the the combination of, as you said, sort of the scientific, but also sort of the human aspect, the idealized sort of. Uh, you, you talked earlier about the rabbit and the dog. You know, yeah, right. we're all sort of deterministic in the sense that we're motivated by something, right? Right. And so, the, the more that organizations can, you know, really explore what are those underlying drivers of us as humans and humans working together collectively through well thought out process that's kind of the magic combination the one two punch right that uh, helps produce better outcomes better results but also creates a more enriching sort of human experience for organizations you know you, you and i talked earlier too pre-show about you know jim hackett whom i uh, advise and work with and you know it's just a uh, brilliant thinker always talked about unlocking human promise as as is uh, uh, underlying sort of mission to the business that they um, developed when he was CEO of Steelcase, right? Though they made furniture, they shifted their their understanding about and it's not just producing chairs and desks and, and putting them into a neat, interesting arrangement, but it was in the context of helping individuals be their full selves, right? No, you know, I mean, it's it's so amazing because like, I mean, you know, I grew up in the shadow of steel case. I'm from, you know, Michigan, we do this. I'm from right. Yankee Springs, Michigan. You know, yeah. everybody's dream was to work at steel case. And I, you know, I did some stuff with work with steel case, um, just had these amazing conversations. I mean, and this relates to actually some work by a friend of mine, Michael Che at UCLA, like mm -hmm. this book called Rational Ritual, like in a lot of, in a lot of sort of religions and organizations, people sit in a circle. And if you're sitting in a circle, everybody can see everybody else. And so there's common knowledge. Alternatively, if I set up a room where like, you know, I'm sitting, standing at the front, speaking to everybody else as the supreme leader, like in the Soviet, Supreme Soviet, everybody only sees me and no one else can see like how people are reacting to me that well, right? And so it's, it's not leading to sort of collective wisdom and common knowledge, but instead it's me dictating what's going on. And if you think like the House of Commons in Britain, where the two parties like stare at each other, that creates this sort of necessarily sort of confrontational approach, which, which has pluses and minuses. Each of those three things, you know, sort of a collective understanding, a one-way communication, and a dyadic confrontation all differ. But what's fascinating, and I think this is where Steelcase like absolutely freakishly got it right. They design the room, they're gonna dictate the nature of the interaction. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so if you don't think through that. If you don't think through what is, so like I'm here at the Center for the Advanced Studies at Stanford this year, and it's set up like a hotel, like it, it's like the most beautiful Motel 6 you can imagine, like a bunch of little like <laughs> single, no, like, like, you know, it looks like little like single row hotel rooms where you enter your office from the outside. And then you look over Stanford's gorgeous campus. 
Um, and the idea here is this is a place where you come and on your own, finish a book. You work really, really hard. So people get together and have lunch, share ideas, but you go back and it's a, it's a time to knuckle down and work. Santa Fe Institute where I hang out is all glass. People write on the walls. I was told when I get here, Scott from Santa Fe, you cannot write on the walls, you know, the, on the glass windows, it's not allowed. Um, and you share offices. And it's because there, it's not a place to like sit down and hunker down and do work. It's more a place like sharing ideas, generating ideas, that sort of stuff. And boy, Steelcase got this, I think, 10 years before anybody else did, right? Other right. than Jungian, Jungian psychologists got it a long time. But you know, but, but yeah, you know, of course. Well, you no. know, but it, yeah. And so, yeah, and they have some just, I, I think it's funny because like people's perception of Steelcase is it's my chair. And I remember when I would say to people, you know, Steelcase owns IDEO. I mean, they've it, since sold right. it. People would be like, what? I mean, yeah. you know, that was like saying, you know, a company that makes, you know, toilet paper holders, you know, owned a nuclear power plant company. You know, it was just, we, people just couldn't, you know, or was making movies or something. You know, it was just so disjoint, but yet still case way ahead of the curve. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's seeing that sort of uh, vision of the magical combination of bringing those, that diversity, that is a perfect example of that. I, I know before I even had the opportunity to work with them, I had that same, I actually worked with the, uh, Ideo before and uh, when I discovered that they were owned by a furni furniture manufacturer, I would talk about a parochial reaction. <laughs> I was like, what? I know, um, no, I know. But, oh. but, but lo and behold, as I uh, ended up working with them and uh, Jim and others, I was like, oh, I, I get it. It was brilliant that they saw um, far into the future, as you said, those important habits and habitats coming together, right? The habitats in which we dwell and interact and, uh, um, you know, uh, commune together influences very much the habits that we develop, the norms that are established. So that's awesome. Well, oh, and it's so like you, you walk into, uh, I, I feel for these like university administrators, like, you know, or, you know, corporate administration, like you're building a new building and, um, you know, what do you, it's going to have a huge impact on your culture. But the thing is, you don't know how technology is going to change. You don't know what right. problems you're going to have. And so if you don't, and so, and so there's a lot of like flexible design stuff, but I, you walk in a lot of places and you can almost say, boy, I'll bet this building was built in 1987. I know. <laughs> you know, you can, and it's not working now. I um, know. I know. There, yeah. yeah. I've, Believe you me, I, you know, and, and I'm sure you do too. Could trade stories about the, you know, the the uh, um, coming into uh, workplaces that look like a gulag, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know right. and it zapped the energy. There was more the 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 portraits on the wall of bygone leaders had more energy in it than the, <laughs> you know than the people inside of it. Well, this has been a delight. I can't thank Fun. you enough for the generosity of time. It is, was mind blowing. I love this and mind candy for myself. I know it will be for my audience. So much to think about uh, in general uh, about th these um, challenges of complexity that I often think is one of the biggest missions of an innovator is to bring some uh, simplicity to that, right? Ultimately, whether it's, you know, MOG or it's some kind of electronic device, um, how do you take in an appreciation and grasp of complexity and produce something that is simple, elegant, desirable, and doable for, for the, the customer or the user, end user that you're designing something like that. So I, I, I love where you went with this. Um, I, I know we're going to want to stay in touch because I, I'll have you on for another part too, because okay. what I'd love to explore further at some point is just, you know, where is this evolving with increasingly where we didn't get into necessarily that with artificial intelligent data science and, and, right. and how does um, quick digression, you know, years ago, I read this not to be uh, read by, while operating heavy machinery, but this book called, um, you know, uh, uh, medieval technology and social change, um, and, and how um, how um, things like the stirrup influence the rise of feudalism, right? Um, how uh, the plow created the manorial system. You know, just in simple technological changes disrupted the way in which we, as a society, interact. And so, 
Okay. Uh, at some point, let's come back. I'd love to have you back on and let's explore those yeah. as well. So, and like why Siri like destroyed parental authority? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love, that's even more provocative. I know I'm talking about medieval technology. So, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. my, my, my audience will yawn at that, they'll be much more interested in Siri. Um, so. Scott, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, I look forward to staying in touch and uh, really appreciate the, your great uh, insights. Thank you very much, it was my pleasure. You bet.